All right, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Robert Pierre. I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon in the Florida area. I'm currently working with uh, Aspen Dental. So this is just a brief outline about kind of the flow of what we'll talk, talk today about. We'll give you a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, insight about myself, and then we'll kind of go into, you know, a bit about what oral and maxillofacial surgery is, and then proceed with, you know, why could you be interested in OMFS, which is, you'll probably hear me say that for short. That's the, just a little acronym from oral for oral surgery. And then we'll go through a couple of patient cases and then we'll wrap it up with, you know, the journey and process to one getting into dental school. And then if you are interested in specializing in particular oral surgery, then um, we can discuss that as well. And then we'll wrap it up with a Q and A. All right, so a little bit about myself. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, um, but we, pretty much left a year after I was born. So I grew up most of my life in Orlando, Florida. I uh, went to high school at Lyman High School, which um, I went to actually for their engineering institute program. So initially I was kind of geared towards um, engineering, but that kind of changed uh, once I got into undergraduate, which I did at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, and while I was there, I majored in economics and got a BA in that. After Emory, I went to University of Florida for a college of dentistry, go Gators if there are any uh, Gators in the room. Um, and I got my dental degree from there. And then from there, I went on to Brooklyn, New York, which is where I matched into oral surgery at the Brooklyn Hospital Center. Uh, and within that program, I just listed, there was several hospitals that we covered and trained at, which was the Brooklyn VA, um, St. Barnabas Hospital is in the Bronx and also another um, facility was a Bronx Care Center, also in the Bronx. And then Geisinger Medical Center is in Danville, um, Pennsylvania. So what is oral surgery? Um, in particular, oral and maxillofacial surgeons, they treat, they're, they're trained to recognize and treat a wide spectrum of diseases, particularly in the head and neck region facing the jaws. Um, so we deal with hard and soft tissue of pretty much the head and neck region. Uh, we are also trained to administer um, anesthesia. So a lot of us are doing IV sedations in our office. Um, and while you're in residency, you train with the anesthesia team for about five months. Um, so that's where you get most of your training. Um, along with your um, outpatient clinical IV sedation. So we do that routinely from day to day. Um, and we also treat problems such as extractions of the tea. That's usually the bread and butter. Um, patients that present with dental um, deformities or misaligned jaws, we treat that as well. Any tumors and cysts of the jaws um, and as well dental implant surgery. So why OMFS? I mean, to me, I found it to be the bridge between medicine and dentistry. So you get a good complement of both practicing medicine and dentistry at the same time. Um, so I thought that was kind of neat. Um, with oral surgery, you can see immediate results and improvements in your patient population. So that was always great um, for me. And it's a good um, satisfaction to see how quickly and directly you can affect and improve your patient's lives. Um, relative to other surgical specialties, the morbidity is fairly low in, in terms of mortality. So that's always good. And it's very versatile. There's very versatility in the scope of your practice. Um, like I listed here, you know, the thing is we cover, you know, facial trauma, dental alveolars, usually bread and butter, extractions, wisdom teeth, as you guys may know, TMJ, we do TMJ surgeries, um, cosmetics, um, infections and pathology, head and neck cancer. Um, if you want to uh, get a fellowship in that, also microvascular reconstruction. We do hard and soft tissue grafting, dental implants, of course, IV sedation and anesthesia in the office and orthognathics and cleft lip and palate surgery. So there's a wide variety of um, different subspecialties within oral surgery that you can either dabble in all of it or specialize in a particular field of it. So I'll kind of gear this talk more towards the residency aspect of oral surgery, because I think that's the, the most important part. So on your day to day, um, as a resident, you will take trauma call, emergency call, which they can page you for whatever time. Mostly it's gonna be for maxillofacial fractures um, within the head and neck region, either infections or abscesses also within the head and neck. You'll get called for a lot of lacerations, whether they're adults or pediatric lacerations and tooth avulsions, which is very common in the pediatric population. Um, you'll have patients coming to ED. A lot of times it's like 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night and they were playing around, they busted their front tooth came out. So they want you to you know, put it back and splint it in, which we do routinely. Um, patients that you may see overnight in the ED and either have to admit because of a fracture or infection or, or whatever else may be, you'll round on those inpatients usually in the morning with your team. So typically if you were on call the night before, you got to pre-round on all those patients, get your notes in, um, make sure everything's up to date before you round with your chief and the rest of the team. 
Um, and then usually after rounds, the interns and lower residents will usually go to clinic where a clinic is usually from eight to five. And then usually the chief and senior residents are usually in the operating room for most of the day. And again, while you're in residency, you'll attend and present, you know, countless lectures and conferences. And again, operating inpatient and outpatient cases. So in the clinic, we'll do a lot of IV sedations as well. This is just a couple of pictures here um, of some uh, trauma case that I did. So this patient came in, um, was in a drunk fight, uh, had a, I don't have the pre-op picture here, but the, the mandible fracture on the left side was pretty displaced. Um, so we actually did, we got a stereolithic model, which you can see on the most right-handed um, picture here. So I, I knew it was gonna be a big fracture. So we pre-bent the plate preoperatively. So I did it like the day before um, we got them. So this model is actually to size of the patient's jaw. We used it with a CT scan and striker. So they're able to fabricate this jaw, which is identical um, to the patient. So you can pre-bent the plate to fit the patient's anatomy perfectly. So when you get into the operating room, it just fits like a glove because um, these are very hard plates to bend. So you kind of save about 45 minutes intra-op um, of bending time trying to figure out, bend the plate, try it in, take it out again, bend it some more until you get a good fit. So um, that was great. We were able to do that for the patient. So we were able to save a lot of operating room time. And then this is just the closure for that patient. Um, but you can see we have good adaptation and anatomic reduction of that fracture on this side. All right, so we'll go into some patient cases. Um, so first case, um, HPI again is a history, history of present Ill illness. So this is a 53 year old male who presented status post assault to the face outside a local bar. Um, pertinent past medical history was HIV, hep C and cocaine use and he had no known uh, drug allergies. So typically when you go see a patient in the ED, when they call you for a consult, you'll do a full, you know, head to toe exam. Um, you'll check the vitals. You'll go through, you'll, you'll have a systemic um, list of, you know, different areas of the body that you go through. So you go through the head, you know, ears, eyes, nose, throat, you'll check the extremities, you'll review, um, review of systems, um, you know, how the cardiac you know, st stability is, you know, respiratory, abdomen, you'll check all those areas, musculoskeletal, the neural um, assessment, you'll do all that as well. Uh, for the sake of this um, presentation, I kind of just limited to EOE means extra oral exam and IOE is intraoral exam. So the extra oral findings, um, pretty much meaning outside the mouth, um, this patient had left lower third facial edema. So we had a lot of swelling. There was no extra oral laceration. So we had no really open deep cuts um, along the face. Um, he did have positive left B3 paresthesia. So um, as you'll see, this fracture kind of goes through a nerve that traverses the mandible on, on both sides. So whenever a patient has a fracture that kind of goes through that nerve, they're going to have paresthesia, which pretty much is just altered sensation in the area of the lip and chin area. Intraorally, he had a maximum incisal opening of 30 millimeters. Um, that's pretty significant finding. So most patients, um, naturally have an opening from like 45 to 50. Um, and another important finding, this patient is a dentalist. So he has no teeth in the top or bottom jaw. So this, this um, amount should have been even a lot higher. So that's significant of trauma. He had no intraoral swelling and there was no wound breakdown intraorally. So there was no open lacerations inside the mouth. So this is a 3D rendering of a CT scan um, to kind of show you he has a, you can see this displacement here along the left side of the mandible, we call this the angle. So he has a left angle fracture here and it's pretty telescoped and displaced. Again, you can see he has um, no teeth. So he's completely edentulous. And um, after reviewing the CT and all the different cuts and we'll always go through, you know, coronal, um, axial and sagittal, which are just different cuts and different views to see the same slice. So you can just make sure you're not missing anything um, when you evaluate the scans. This is a panorex. So here you can appreciate the fracture on this side and you know, you're always comparing right to left. Um, so you can see there's continuity here on the right side versus you can see this fracture displacement here. And this dark line here, if you can appreciate, this is the inferior alveolar nerve canal. So you can see that fracture goes right through that nerve. So that's, when you see that most patients will always present with some numbness in the area of the lip and chin. So that's pretty diagnostic. So our diagnosis is a displaced left angle fracture. And this is just a diagram. This is a diagram of the lower jaw, the mandible. And these are just kind of showing you the frequencies of fractures um, when patients are assaulted or you know, are sus um, 
susceptible to any type of trauma. These are the kind of areas where the fracture patterns will happen. And this kind of just so it shows you the percentages of frequency to take place in those particular areas. So our patient had a fracture in the angle, which is normally just behind the third molar. So the treatment plan for this patient was open reduction internal fixation via transcutaneous approach. So pretty much transcutaneous, we were gonna go an outside approach through the skin um, underneath the jaw, and we were going to open reduce and plate those fractures. So that's what we mean by open reduction internal fixation. So particularly for the mandible, um, there's different approaches we can take depending on where the fracture is. So in this patient, we were going extra oral, like I mentioned before, and we call this a submandibular approach. Um, so this is just a diagram kind of going through that sequence. So this here, this incision is made, and we usually do it about two centimeters below the inferior board of the mandible. And that's just to account for, there's a branch of the facial nerve that kind of courses through here that you kind of want to avoid because that can, um, cause them to have paralysis on that side, especially at the, the lip, which could be pretty disfiguring. So that's why we always approach it two centimeters below the mandible. And this is just going through the layers. So the platysma, kind of the neck muscle area, cutting through that. And while we're doing this dissection, once we get through the, the platysma layer, we know we're getting closer and closer to the nerve. So in the operating room, they have nerve stimulators we, we can use to test. And you'll just test different layers of the fascia. And if you see any twitching, um, in the lip and chin area, you know you might be near a nerve, so you gotta kind of redirect your dissection. So here they're just kind of getting towards the different layers of the fascia. We can see some a nerve here. This is the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. And you can see here we have the facial artery and facial um, vein as well. So we gotta get through this without injuring um, the nerve. So you gotta kind of retract the nerve out of the way. The vessels usually we clip and ligate to get it out of our dissections so we can avoid any uh, significant bleeding. And this is kind of just kind of giving you a diagram of that. So we're going through the layers. Um, once we get through this fascia, we know the nerve, the facial nerve is going to be in that region. Usually we have to cut the, the, the facial vessels to get to the bone. And once we get that out of the way, we can retract everything and approach to the mandible um, and get to the fracture. And the last layer before you get to the actual bone is called the periosteum. That's the layer that's always investing over um, the bone. So we cut through that and you should be able to, you, when you're doing it, you should be able to palpate the bone. So You'll feel for bone first, make sure you're in the right area, then you can cut. Usually we'll use electrocautery to cut through that and you can get a, get a nice clean incision straight down to the bone. And then you'll just expose your fracture. Make sure you get good exposure because um, you can't plate what you can't see. So once you get good access and good exposure, you can access the fracture and then you reduce it. Um, once you're happy with your reduction, then you can um, plate it as well. Once you plate it, then you'll just close it in layers to avoid any dead space. So you close your periosteum close your muscle layer, and then you close the skin. And this is that patient. This is just a um, couple of intra-op pictures. This is after we did the fixation. So we were able to, again, we accessed it through the neck here, got the reduction. So we have a nice reduction here and we use a superior border plate um, with monocortical screws. And then here we use a heavier um, inferior border plate which bicortical, so it goes through um, both cortices of the bone. And this is just a, a post-op imaging. So you see now we, yeah, we have good alignment, good anatomic reduction. And in his case, since he has no teeth, usually we'll, a patient that does have teeth, we can wire them shut into their natural bite. And once we know we have them in their natural bite, usually that kind of brings the segments pretty close together. So we know um, we have good reduction, but here, since he doesn't, we have to go purely anatomically. So you have to really get good access so you can see that your fracture is completely lined up. And this is just a post-op um, panorex. So you can see we have good adaptation of that fracture. And that patient went on to do well. And typically, their post-operative care um, after the case is usually one to two days with these um, fractures. We usually don't keep them in-house too much longer after that. Um, as long as they're you know, functioning well, they're including OK, pain is well under control with um, oral pain medications, they're usually good to go home. And then they just follow up in the clinic. All right, so our second case is a 55-year-old male, um, denied any past medical history, known on drug allergies, denied any past surgical history, um, social history, he was a smoker. Um, mechani mechanism of injury for this patient, he was assaulted by multi multiple assailants with fists to the face. So again, physical exam. So on this patient, um, he had pretty significant injuries to his face. He had step deformities on both sides. So when we're evaluating this patient, we'll, you know, we'll palpate al along the mandible, along the lower jaw. And usually if it's displaced, you'll, you'll be able to feel a step 
um, deformity wherever the fracture is. You know, obviously they're going to have swelling. He had fractures on both sides of the mandible, so he had edema on both sides, so bilateral facial edema in the lower facial third. Obviously, he's going to be tender to the palpation. Um, he didn't have any extra oral lacerations, um, and he did have numbness on both sides of the jaw. Intraorally, he did have swelling as well. Um, guarding trismus, so trismus means he had limited opening, so maximum opening was about 15 millimeters, so that's pretty significant. He had positive malocclusion, so he had teeth, and it was, there, his segments were pretty displaced, so malocclusion means you just can't bring your teeth to into your no, normal bite because everything is just displaced and off. Um, and because they were so displaced, then you once you feel the mandible, you can feel it's rocking, so you can feel um, mobility of the mandible. He did have also a maxillary fracture as well um, with intraoral lacerations. So the typical finding when you see a laceration inside on the gums, that's usually where the fracture is. And right there, you can just, just you don't have to put a lot of pressure and they'll jump anyways, but you can easily mobilize the, the segments. So you can see here, pretty displaced fracture here in, three, in two places here, one anteriorly and here posteriorly on the left side. So you can account for the significant uh, mobility and facial edema that the patient has. So that's pretty displaced. So he really got, unfortunately, um, beat up pretty bad. And this is the maxilla. So he just had a fracture right through um, the apex of um, the central incisor up there. So you can see that fracture as well. So for this, which I'll show you at the end, this we had to just kind of reposition it. He didn't want to lose that segment. So we reposition it and we put some arch bars and wires to kind of splint that back in place. And this is kind of a 3D rendering of the facial fractures. Um, so you can see how displaced the segments are and kind of telescope. So, and here's a fracture in the, the maxilla here. So he got hit pretty bad here. So our diagnosis, um, again, kind of showing you that diagram I'll show you on the first um, slide about where the fractures are. So there's different names for depending on the region. So this patient had an open displaced left parasympathous fracture and a right displaced angle fracture, um, as well as maxillary alveolus fractures. As well, in his case, he had multiple non-restorable teeth that were just decayed and broken down. So while he was asleep, we were going to take those teeth out as well. So the treatment plan, open reduction internal fixation with maxillomandibular fixation of bilateral mandible fractures. So maxillomandibular fixation um, pretty much means the patient will be wired shut. So we put them into their natural bite and we put wires to kind of hold them shut. And typically when a fracture is that bad, um, and it varies from surgeon to surgeon, but usually the average time is about four weeks of being wired shut. And it could be up to six weeks, depending on how the patient's healing. And we extracted um, all the non-resorbable teeth that the patient had. So this is post -operatively. So um, the running ring is kind of fuzzy here, but he had, the patient has arch bars. So um, he has arch bars on top and bottom jaw, which are ligated with wires. Um, and they're ligated to the teeth to kind of hold everything together. So we put him in back into his natural bite. So he's wired shut at the end of the case. Um, he has two plates on the parasympathous fracture and one plate back on that angle fracture. And just to, just to recap, so you saw how displaced it was here and we were able to get a pretty um, good reduction on him. So we kind of got him back into his um, pre-wired position. We do, so here is what we call a bridal wire. So this is where he had a significant displacement where the segments were pretty much telescoped up like that. So we kind of put it back and we put some ligature wires around it to kind of hold that segment in place. And that helps us um, plate it as well. So um, pretty good anatomic reduction for him and the patient went on to do well. And this is just pre and post-op. So again, like I said, for this case, for the maxilla, we kind of reposition that segment and we have arch bars and wires to kind of hold in place. And usually you'll, you'll leave that on for several weeks and the bone will, will heal in that, in that position. And then from there, the patient will just got to get endodontic testing um, with the general dentist or endodontist just to make sure the vitality of the teeth are still intact. Um, if they're not, then they'll probably have to get a root canal most times, but at least they can save the teeth. All right, so third case. Um, so this is 18 year old male, past medical history is significant for schizophrenia. Um, the patient presented to the hospital status post alleged assault um, with fist to the head. Um, the patient presented with swelling in the frontal region. So when this region up here, um, upon exam, the patient was found to have a frontal sinus anterior table fracture. He denied any LOC, which means loss of consciousness. So that's pretty significant. So if any patient um, reports loss of consciousness, then usually you wanna get 
um, a trauma consult involved. Usually the gen surge team will do a head to toe exam just to make sure the patient's cleared. Um, and if they're not, sometimes you wanna wait till you get that um, clearance before putting that patient through surgery and putting them to sleep uh, to avoid any other issues. Um, he denied any vision changes or any abnormal nasal or post nasal discharges. So like every trauma case, we'll get a maxillofacial CT scan without contrast, which showed a severely displaced, um, more significant on the right side, frontal sinus anterior uh, table fracture. The nasal frontal recess, which we'll talk about and the posterior table um, weren't involved. Um, and there was a displaced right orbital roof component, which I'll show you on the scan. Again, this patient with the frontal sinus neurosurgery was also consulted um, while the patient was in the ED. And they confirmed the above findings and they also confirmed there was no CSF, which is cerebral spinal fluid leakage. Um, and since there was none of that, the posterior table wasn't involved. So there was no intervention uh, recommended from their standpoint. So this is a uh, axial view of the CT scan. So here you can see a pre-displaced fracture. So this is the frontal sinus and this is all in the forehead region. Um, so you have an anterior table, which is the outside. So anterior table, you know, is the bony structure that you can feel. The posterior table is here, and right behind the posterior table is the brain. So that's why neurosurgery is always consulted. If the posterior table was involved, um, then more than more likely than not, the patient would have a CSF leak. And if that's the case, then usually this turns into a combination type of case where neurosurgery comes in and does their part first, and then we'll um, do our part in terms of re repairing the anterior table. So you can see pretty significant, he got hit pretty bad, I believe with a blunt object, but he said it was a fist, but that was a pretty hard hit. Here's a sagittal view that you can see also the displaced anterior um, table of the frontal sinus. Let's give you that view. And again, the posterior table is intact, so which means there was no compromise to the brain or the CSF. And here's just a 3D rendering. So you can appreciate a pretty much a crushing injury to that forehead there. So he got a pretty bad blow. Um, the complications with this, with you know, not doing anything is obviously you can have a severe cosmetic deformity, um, but also you can develop meningitis, you can get thrombosis in that area, and you can have late findings, which can also present up to like 10, 15 years later, um, like mucosal, so you can develop, you know, pretty late presenting infections in that area, which can be pretty, um, pretty morbid. So diagnosis, so this is an isolated frontal sinus fracture of the anterior table with a right orbital roof fracture. Um, so the plan is to open reduction internal fixation by bicoronal approach. So when you have these uh, fractures here, usually there's two ways that most people, uh, most surgeons will access it. Sometimes you're lucky and the patient has a big laceration right where the fracture is. So you can kind of use that fracture, um, that laceration, sorry, um, to access the fracture, you can extend it and open it up to do your surgery. If they don't have that, then you either are going to make an incision there, which could also be pretty cosmetically um, displeasing, or we do a bicoronal approach where we go from the top of the head and bring a, almost like a facelift down. Um, so I'll kind of show you some pictures of that. So here we kind of make we kind of make our incision and we do it in a kind of a you know wavy zigzag fashion. So this is where our incision is going to be, and we're going to kind of dissect and peel all this down to access the fracture here. And we do it in this fashion because when it heals, um, it's pretty cosmetically um, pleasing. It's behind, it's way behind the hairline, um, and it's not directly on the face. So and usually you can get down to the fracture um, pretty quickly. So this is just marking our incision, and we're giving our local anesthesia here. Um, and again, we're just going through our incision and we're developing that flap. So we're developing the flap and there's different layers. You know, you have your scalp, um, you know, acronym. So we're going through the layers and we kind of develop and we get into what we call the subgaleal plane. And that's the plane that we'll get into. And you'll know you're in there because you'll get in there. You can easily start cleaving the fascia and it, you can get pretty down to it. Um, so you're kind of that layer is just right above the pericranium. So like I said, when I was talking about the periosteum and the mandible, that's the, the, the tissue layer that's directly investing the bone. So up here in the scalp, it's called the pericranium, which is the, the same idea. So we stay right above that layer until we get down to kind of like a centimeter before um, the eyebrow. But the, when you stay in this subgaleal fashion, you can get down pretty quick and it's a pretty quick dissection. 
And again, we're just kind of just cleaving, peeling back, and we just we can get down to the fracture pretty quickly. And again, so the pericranium, once we access and clean out the fracture, um, we test to see, so there's a duct, I can show you back. So you kind of have a duct, which we call the nasal frontal duct. And it's just pretty much like a, uh, like almost like a sinus tract where, where your mucus and things can drain. So when you have this fracture, you want to assess, is this duct occluded? Is it compromised? Is it crushed? If it is, then you need to do what we call obliteration, which is mean we clean out the entire sinus, we remove all the mucosa, we burr it out, we clean it out, we take everything out um, to make sure it's completely cleaned of any tissue, anything um, that can cause an infection or um, problems later. Because if it's, it is blocked, then you're not gonna have good drainage. So we have to obliterate it. So once we clean it out, then you have to fill it, the whole sinus up with a material. It can be fascia, it can be fat, um, you can be the pericranium. So that's why we leave that intact, just in case you have to use it. So you'll test it. So pretty much you can squirt a fluid. Some people use different types of fluid, propofol or saline, and you'll squirt it into the duct. And if you see it come out um, down through that nasal passage, and sometimes you can see that fluid in the posterior pharynx as well. If you see that drainage, if it's passive and it's not in its patent and it's not occluded, then you don't have to obliterate. But if it's not, if it's occluded, then you have to do the obliteration where you'll clean it out which we still do anyways, but then you have to fill up the whole sinus with some type of material, whether it's fat or fascia or anything like that. And this is just more pictures of the dissection, getting down to the fracture. So here, so here's a fracture there. So sometimes it's in multiple segments. So what we'll do is we'll take out, sometimes you, I mean, you pretty much have to take out the anterior table and you kind of stuff. So you have to kind of remember the orientation that was that it was in, because you're going to try to use those segments um, to put back when you put your fixation um, to plate the fracture. So we'll, we'll, you will take those segments out so we can have access to the sinus. We'll clean everything out, like I said, clean it out, burr it out to remove all the remaining mucosa. You test the ducts to, to see if they're patent, and then you can do your obliteration with the fascia um, if need be. And this, we use a, a mesh plate here. So once, and this pretty much, you know, you conform it to the rest of the skull there um, on the frontal bones, and then you can place multiple screws just to fixate it into the solid bone there. And then once you're done with your fixation, then you can um, proceed with your closure. And here, when you, you close the layer, you'll close, you know, you'll, you'll place, you know, your um, subcuticular sutures as well. And then on the skin, you know, you have your choice of doing skin sutures as well, or you can use staples, which are easily removable um, postoperatively in the clinic when the patient arrives. So here you can kind of see, uh, so now we have good continuity of that frontal bone segment over the frontal sinus, anterior, anterior table is nice and intact. And here, so here's an axial view of this, the mesh um, for that reconstruction. So very good adaptation there, um, it's preventing any functional or cosmetic deformities of the patient. And this is just a 3D rendering, so you can see that mesh there. And we put one plate. So this is the orbital root fracture right above the eye where he had displacement as well. So we use the mesh and we put a plate there as well on the right side. And this is the patient post operatively. So this is just the post-op healing. Um, and like I said, the stables come out. So it's healing really nicely, this incision, and the stables come out, you know, pretty easily. It takes a couple minutes to take them out. All right, last case. So this is um, case four. So this is a 23-year-old male, um, past medical history significant for special needs, diet, any medications, no, um, no known drug allergies, past surgical history for hernia repair, and no social history. So his chief complaint was, I haven't been able to open my mouth wide most of my life. So the patient reported limited opening, which uh, progressively got worse as he got older. He denied any acute events or any trauma um, previously. So physical exam, for the most part, was fairly benign. Um, again, TNJ, there was no clicks or pops, no preauricular tenderness, which is just right in front of the ear. Um, he didn't have any issues there. Um, but again, his opening was pretty limited, only 20 millimeters, which is pretty limited for, uh, for a patient. Like I said, average is about 40 to 50. He did have multiple carious teeth, which is understandable. If he can't really open, it's probably hard to really brush and maintain um, good oral hygiene. So that was understandable. Um, and there was no edema or anything like that. But pa again, patient, um, since he couldn't open that wide, the exam was also limited, um, 
because it was just hard to see uh, back there. So this is a diagram, just a uh, picture just showing the limited opening. So one finger breast, you usually should be able to get at least three fingers, especially for um, an adult male, three to four fingers you should be able to get in um, and we can only get one finger. So that's pretty telling. This is a panorex um, just showing. So multiple carrier's teeth that we were gonna have to address as well. He does have impacted wisdom teeth as well. Um, and here, it's hard to appreciate here. So that's why in our clinic, we got a cone beam CT as well. So this is the condyle. This is the arch. So this is like your cheekbone coming across here. And this is the coronoid, which is also part of the mandible. This is the coronoid process that's kind of sticking up above the arch. Um, and you can, it's, you can kind of appreciate it on this x-ray. So this is a um, CT scan as well. So this is just a coronal view, just showing the condyles. And here, when you move a couple of slices, you can start to see the coronoid coming into view here, which are pretty elongated. And this is the right side of the view. So this is the condyle again, this is the coronoid process. This is where the arch is, and this is how high the coronoid is sticking above it. Usually is kind of down here. And same thing here, you can kind of see it's pretty elongated, pretty well above the arch. And this is just the left showing you the same thing. So very elongated coronoid process well above the arch. And this is kind of a 3D running. So the issue is here when you try and open, so the jaw translates um, and rotates. So you rotate first for about 15 millimeters. And then when you get your really big opening is when the jaw tr uh, translates and comes down. So as the jaw rotates and goes down, since the coronoid process is so high above the cheekbone, it's hitting the arch and that's causing that, um, that functional stop where he can't get past 15 to 20 millimeters to get into his translational movement. Um, so that's been the issue for him all this time. And, you know, he spent most of his life, you know, not dealing with not knowing why. And we saw him in the clinic when we were able to, to diagnose it. So uh, I was really happy to see and treat this patient. So the assessment here is trismus secondary to bilateral coronoid hyperplasia. And uh, again, he had multiple carrier's teeth that we were gonna have to address as well. So we took this patient to the operating room. So this is kind of a diagram um, to show how the access to get to the coronoid. So you'll make an intraoral incision here, and this is kind of just lateral to, you'll make an incision kind of lateral to the mandible uh, posteriorly in the back. And then here we kind of just glide up the anterior ramus, and this is the one, and that kind of just gets us to where the coronoid is. And the plan is to go in there and just um, cut the coronoids out and remove them. So, this is the coronoids after I, I cut them out. And the, the key here is once you get up there, cause it is, you have the temporalis muscle, which is um, attached to it. So it's a tenacious attachment. So once you make the cut, you really gotta, and it's hard to see, it's almost like you're making a blind cut. So you gotta grasp um, the coronoid. It's very tedious. Doing the cut is the easy part, but getting the coronoid out is the, the tough part. Cause if you let it go after you, after you're, you do the cut, the muscle is just gonna take it straight up and then it goes to no man's land. And uh, good luck finding it. And sometimes it may happen, and then you just gotta you gotta leave. It. And sometimes it, the patient's still able to to function and still improve. But um, the key thing is to hold on to it, and you got you got to kind of use a bovi electrocautery to just kind of cut the muscle all around the attachment of, of the bone um, without losing it in, in space. And that's just another diagram of the coronoids. And so here, so again, the patient was at 20 millimeters preoperatively. Immediately after taking out the coronoids, he's at like 50 now. Um, so significant improvement in opening. Um, so we're really happy for the result that we got there. The key for this though, even afterwards, because you can, things can tighten, things can contract, things can fibrose. So post-operative therapy is the most important thing after that because they can regress. So. They have to go through extensive jaw stretching exercises. So you still want to see these patients regularly um, to keep stretching them open until it gets really habitual and the muscles get used to being open again. Because again, he's been 20 years plus with um, that kind of opening. So it's going to take a lot of post-operative physical therapy to maintain that opening. But getting it to 50 millimeters immediately afterwards was a, a, a great um, success for us. So this is just a post-operative scan. So you can see the cut here where the con uh, coronoid was. Remember, it came way above the, the arch, the cheekbone here. So now you cut it here. Uh, so now that patient has uh, free room to open and close. 
All right, so journey to dentistry and Ole Fest. Um, so again, those who are in high school, obviously you want to do well. You want to do well in your, um, in your courses now. Um, SAT, ACT, we're definitely important to get good scores on those. Try to get as much shadowing and volunteer experience as you can. I know it's been tough with um, COVID and all that. Um, so I definitely commend um, this initiative with the pre-health um, shadowing. I think this is great for you guys. Um, while in undergraduate, of course, you want to do well in your core sciences. Uh, major in something you enjoy. I think that would be the biggest um, advice I can give you. You don't have to major in a science. I mean, it's great if you do, if that's what you want to do. But if you're passionate about a different subject, you can major in that as well. You just have to take your core sciences um, you know, on top of your major. So your chem, your orgo, your bio, microbio. Um, so don't feel that you have to major in a chemistry or a biology major to um, go into, you know, professional programs. Um, you definitely want to shadow um, as much as you can. Um, volunteer. So what got it for me, I I mean, this was, you know, a while back when I started volunteering. Um, my first time was doing a mission trip. I think it was with Vita Volunteers, but we went to Costa Rica and Panama. Um, I was in my junior year undergraduate, and I think that's what kind of sold it for me on dentistry. I had a great time there. Um, so obviously, you want to do one of your classes, and those classes that you do well in, you want to get a good rela relationship with your professor so you can get good um, letters of recommendation. Um, the DAT is the standardized exam that you take for dental school, so you definitely want to do well on that. Um, schools definitely look at that. Your personal statement, of course, you want to have a really good personal statement. You know, prepare it, read it, read it again, keep editing it, have people look at it, um, and make sure whatever you write, you remember and know what you you talked about. Because a lot of times in interviews. They'll pull something from your personal statement, so you don't want to draw a blank uh, if they ask you something that you wrote about. Um, and then just get a focus list, kind of figure out where you want to go to school, um, where you want to live for the next four years. That you know you should take that into account. Um, the different financial aid packages the schools are doing, so all that you want to like um, get a little focus list of the schools that you may be interested in, so you can narrow it down. While you're in dental school, again. You want to do well academically, so well in your clinical and didactic courses. Um, class rank usually was a, a major component in terms of programs, in terms of um, getting into programs. Uh, some schools I know they may not have class rank anymore, so I'm not sure how that's playing out. But um, if that's still a thing, then a lot of programs do look at your class rank. Externships especially for oral surgery were a great thing. It lets pro programs see that you have a, you know, an interest in their field. It shows that you take an initiative. So um, when I was in dental school, you were able to go out to different oral surgery programs and usually you can stay there for a week and you can kind of just follow the residents around, scrubbing on their cases and get to know the program, get to know the residents, get to know the faculty there. Um, and then if you shine well there, they usually remember you and you, you can, that can boost your chances of getting an interview and potentially matching into a program. For oral surgery now, um, the CBSC is the major standardized test that you have to take um, as part of your application. It's kind of, it's almost like a mini step one. Um, so people who are on the med school track, I'm sure know about this um, exam as well. Um, so you have to do well on that. That's pretty weighed heavily now. So, you know, I've been on the side of, you know, taking it and then also interviewing applicants um, as well, um, and you know, sitting down with different chairmen, and most programs weigh heavily on that score now. So that's um, become almost the most important thing, um, in my view, aside from the rest of your application. But getting a good score can do wonders for your application. Um, and then spend as much time as you can in the oral surgery clinic, if that's something you're interested in, or what, whatever specialty that you you know you're interested in going to spend some time in there as much as you can. Um, if you have an oral surgery program at your um, your school or your university, spend some time in there. That's the best way to do it while you're in dental school. Let the residents know you, let the chairman know you because you're gonna wanna get a letter of recommendation from the chairman um, of the program you're at for sure. So it'll be great if they know you well and like you well enough so they can give you a really strong letter um, to help your application. Uh, and this is just, a, so again, I showed you some Cool hospital case that we that um, I did while I was in residency as well. But again, implants and extractions are still the bread and butter of oral surgery. Um, in private practice, you know, pretty much your day to day is you're doing a lot of sedations, which I'm doing now. You're placing implants. So this patient, um, she had her wisdom teeth 
I took all four of her wisdom teeth out and she had missing teeth here. So I placed two dental implants where she'll get restored and get crowns um, in, those, in those two sites um, later on. So dental implants, um, extractions, that's kind of the bread and butter. Um, you know, this, imp this patient had a, uh, she had a broken down tooth here. So I took it out and placed an implant um, the same day. Um, this is another implant that she had that was restored with a crown. Um, so those are the day-to-day. -day. This was a laceration I did in the ED. Um, this patient was in a bad motor vehicle accident. Um, so she got sent through the, the front windshield. So she had a lot of glass and debris in this, in this uh, laceration. So I spent probably 45 minutes or so. It spent a while just picking out all the little shards of glass because you don't want to close this wound with debris and, and shards in there because it's just going to get infected. It's going to break down. Um, so that's the worst thing you do. So you really got to spend your time here cleaning it out, washing it out, pressure irrigation to really wash it out um, and just pick out, you know, you have to go through the titulator because it's re actually really deep. So you got to get down in there um, and get all the shards out, clean it out really well, get all the glass, get all the debris out. Um, then we close it up. Um, and she she also did have a jaw fracture. So this was in the trauma bay. This was like, like four in the morning. So once she was stable, they got in the ICU. Um, she had other injuries as well. She had orthopedic injuries. So once she was cleared um, for us to take her, we took her um, a couple of days later to the operating room to repair her mandible. And I believe she had a cheekbone fracture that we repaired as well. Um, so that's it. That's it for me. So I'll take any questions and feel free to find me on Instagram if you have any questions or just want to connect with me. Um, you know, you can hit me up anytime. But thank you guys for your time. All right, people all over the world, you've heard it from Dr. Pierre. Thank you so much for your presentation today. That was super insightful. Like we never, I never knew that dentistry could also have a surgery aspect to it. So that was very, very cool. Uh, so. As a Black healthcare provider, do you have any words of wisdom for people of who are a minority pursuing a career like yours? Like, did you have a role model? Uh, did your identity influence who you are today and your career? Um, I think it definitely does. I mean, you you go through, um, at least for me, I mean, from my track record going through, I mean, you kind of go, as you go through high school, you go through college, um, you know, in my experience, you know, that pool of, you know, minorities and black people around you, they're doing the same thing with you. It, it kind of gets smaller and smaller, you know, the higher you climb. Um, so you definitely got to look, you got to look for, you know, different mentors, um, which I had. I mean, even from my high school teachers, you know, she believed in me and um, she kind of initially pushed me to, you know, go for like, it, I mean, from high school, like she said, get the, it was a Gates Millennium Scholarship, which gave me full right to Emory. And she made me stay up till like 11 o'clock at night to fill out the application. I didn't want to do it because there was so many pages, but she said, no, you're going to sit down and do it. So she made me do it. And I got, I got the scholarships and I went on to Emory. So like, even my mom, like, you know, thanks her to this day. Um, so you have different people like that in your corner. Um, and as you go on, you got to find, you know, different colleagues because it does get smaller and smaller. Um, you know, I don't think I had really a black um, faculty teacher besides her until I was, um, in residency. So I had, I had a, a black attending um, in my program. And that was actually really the first um, professor attending that was black that I had, um, you know, one-to-one. -one. Um, so you, you, gotta, you gotta try to find those different mentors, you know, they're out there. Um, you know, while I was in dental school, we had, um, you know, there was some different endodontists, you know, there was SNDA. So it was a different programs where we had mentors there um, that could guide us and give us instruction um, and stuff like that. So you kind of use that, you know, you know, sometimes you're in a small, small arena, but you just, you know, you try not to let it bother, bother you. you know that you deserve to be here. If you, you put the work in, you do what you have to do, you know, you earn the right to be where you are. So you just use that as motivation to keep going. Thank you so much for answering that. I definitely agree on um, how super specializations and the how it gets like smaller and smaller and just gets much more difficult to find people you, you kind of connect with. So the next question that we had for you was, um, what made you switch from engineering to dentistry? Funny thing, so, um, so I was doing an internship while I was in high school with Lockheed Martin and it was great. We were doing like military stuff and stuff like that. 
Um, and fun thing is my dad, he was electro, electrical engineering um, in New York before we moved down to Florida. And, you know, he got laid off and there was like a lot of people that got laid off with him at that time. And I think at that time, um, engineering's, engineers were, I guess, were getting laid off fairly consistency, uh, consistently. Um, and sometimes the system they would ha uh, have was you'd come in as an entry level engineer. And then when you or get to that point where you should be getting a senior engineer salary, they sometimes may lay, lay off, you know, half and then hire a new entry level group of engineers so they can pay them the base salary and stuff like that. So um, he was always, you know, telling me about that, but I didn't literally listen to him and stuff like that. But my last day of the internship on the radio, the next day, like it was on the radio, like Lockheed Martin lays off 3000 engineers. I'm like, oh, I was like, all right, let me just keep my eyes open. I was like, that's not that stable. But um, but I, I still had a, I, I love this. Uh, you know, I did like it a lot. So I said, I'll keep my eyes open. And Emory was pretty, you know, it was more of a liberal arts program and they didn't really have um, engineering or anything like that um, at the university. So then it kind of dwindled from there. Then I just went, you know, liberal arts and just started exploring fields of medicine. You know, I was looking at, you know, medicine as well. Cause over there, like pre-dental wasn't huge. So it was more so like, pre-med you know they had a great business school so people on the business track or, or pre-law stuff like that so that was like the dominating fields and dominating advisors there wasn't really like pre-dental advisors um, even though Emory did have a dental school back in the day so um, again I reached back to outside people who kind of like you know through dentistry in my my ear so I'm like okay I'll look into it and then like I said when I went when I did the mission trip in Costa Rica I went there first to Costa, Costa Rica and Panama and I saw how I could effectively, and we had, you know, great faculty dentists that were just, you know, you're kind of helping them out, you know, they're doing extractions or fillings and stuff like that. And we're doing cleanings and, you know, dental education and just the response and the love that I got from the patients there who were so happy um, just to get toothbrush and toothpaste, just to get them out of pain by immediately by taking the tooth out. So that experience alone is what sold it for me. Um, I think it was more rewarding for me than it was for them, just uh, how much we were able to help them on the spot. So that kind of sold it for me. That's pretty inspiring. And I hope this also happens to people in the audience so they can also become uh, oral and maxillofacial uh, surgeons like you someday. Mm -hmm. So uh, on your way to becoming who you are today, uh, we were wondering if surgery somewhat scared you and if you had to overcome that fear. Like I had to look at that picture and then I found myself reeling and I wonder if you felt the same way at some point. Um, I don't think I did. I mean, I think, I mean, you're right. I mean, sometimes it's just something you either enjoy off the jump or something that you has got to get accustomed to. Um, I think, I mean, even dental school, you know, you'll, from there you're taking out teeth. And from when I was in dental school, you know, you do your hospital rotation as part of our curriculum. So you get to spend time with the oral surgery residents and go into the hospital and see what they do. Um, and then from there, you can kind of see at, you know, at first hand, if you like that stuff. And I realized I did, you know, we could be in a case for like 11 hours and like, I didn't even realize, you know, we're all in there. No one scrubbed out to use the bathroom. We're like still standing there until like at the end of the day and you realize it's like 11 o'clock. Um, and it was still fun. It was still fun. So I think, um, I don't know. I didn't really feel squirmish or anything like that. I kind of enjoyed it. The only thing that, that took getting used to was infections, um, just the smell of them, like really bad infections smell really, really bad the first time you encounter them. And then after a couple, you just kind of get used to it. And you, you, I guess you just get dull to it. So I think infection, the smell of infections was like the worst, uh, but you get used to that pretty quickly. Yeah, I kind of get that. It's a little squirmish at first, but I think um, like a year or two into like the grad school, it should be okay. Right. Um, so the next question that we have is when you have a severe full body trauma case, could you talk about how you coordinate with other medical professionals? Right. So when a patient comes in um, into the trauma bay, let's say they have multiple bodily injuries, so they're going to the trauma bay and usually um, they'll call, they'll usually call us towards the end um, unless it's like strictly maxillofacial. So if they have either rib injuries or orthopedic injuries um, or any neurological injuries, usually neuro is called immediately if they, 
if they suspect any neurological deficits. Um, ortho is usually called, um, if, we, if there's like a eye injury, we get called at the same time as ophthalmology. Um, I usually always run into ophthalmology at like right when, they, they get there right when I get there if it's for like a orbital injury. Um, but I mean, the trauma bay that you have the trauma team there, gen surge, so they're gonna stabilize the patient first. Um, so once the patient's out of critical condition, um, if there was like more morbid injuries, then they'll call um, us for our particular region. So if it's opto or ortho or, you know, oral surgery, they'll call us once the patient is stabilized and then they'll give us the rundown and they'll kind of let us do our thing. So if it's like for that patient with the laceration, once she was stabilized, you know, intubated, once she, all that was taken care of. And I think orthopedics were doing their stuff first. And once they were done um, and neurosurgery, I think they had to put a bolt in her as well. So once they did their part and she was stabilized, then they let me come in and do the laceration and assess her. So yeah, they have a systematic way of doing it to make sure the patient's out of critical condition um, before they call us. Cause most, like I said before, the morbidity for our um, specialty is um, fairly low compared to others. So if it's patient is critical, then I gotta call us first to repair the laceration. Um, Cause that can wait. Yeah, that was very insightful. There's still a lot of collaboration here, which we really appreciate. Absolutely. So pretty sure you have a family and you have a life outside of work. So how do you balance out work with life plus virtual shadowing with us? And also how long do the surgeries take? Because normally on shows, they take like hours and hours. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, definitely have a family. I have a, a daughter and um, she's about to be two. So uh, we had her while I was still in residency. So that was, you know, definitely an adjustment, especially um, from residency into now post-residency and private practice. And residency, you know, your hours aren't really your own for the most part. Um, so you got to be able to stomach getting home late in you know, late hours or like when you're on call, you're going in and out or you just got to stay at the hospital. Um, so that you definitely have to um, work out. And luckily, you know, my wife is, you know, very understanding. She's a general dentist, so she knows um, kind of what I was going through at the time. So you need someone who's going to support you, be in your corner, understand you. It's going to be a lot of late nights, late hours studying. Um, you know, you got presentations after you had a long day that you got to present for tomorrow. So you get home, you know, the baby wants to play, but you got to, you're tired. You want to eat and get to work because you, know, you want to get to sleep before it's like six in the morning, you got to wake up. So it's, it's tough. Um, but I mean, it's, it was, you know, it's still great. So I still make the time because I'm like, yeah, she's not going to be young forever. So I still, you know, take half hour, even if I have to like stay up late and down to five hour, you know, I, I'll do it. So now on the other side, you definitely have more time. I'm still busy, um, but I, you know, you have more control of your schedule. So now I only do Monday through Thursdays. So Fridays I have off um, and I just got appointed my privileges at the hospital. So I'll probably start doing some cases on, on Fridays or the weekends. But so um, yeah, Monday through Fridays, you have your, your eight to five type of schedule. So you have more time to have some family time in, I took Fridays off just to make sure we have like a day of just um, hanging out and stuff like that. So it, it's definitely doable. It's, it takes effort, time. You got to really put the effort in to make it work, but you definitely um, can make it happen. I've had classmates who had families while they're in dental school, which I thought was even harder because it's just so much didactic and clinical and exams all the time. So I don't know how they did that, but it's doable. That really touches upon the work-life balance that you may have or at least at this point of in your career, it would be definitely helpful. Um, so the next question kind of goes off on that. As a surgeon, how do you deal with the stress of surgery or just being with patients and dealing with them? Um, it definitely can be stressful um, daily. So like one thing I would say before you go into any surgical specialty, um, make sure you really wanna do it. Um, don't go over anything else, but have a make sure you have a passion for it because it definitely will knock you off your feet a lot um you'll be stressed out a lot um you know like i said the late nights the tough cases you know a lot of cases may go well but you could have that one case that doesn't and that just kills your whole mood your whole vibe for the day but you got to come back and do the same thing tomorrow so you got to be able to bounce back recover remember it's you know we call it practice of medicine, practice of dentistry, you know, so you're always practicing, you're always trying to get better. So every day is a new day to come back and do the same thing and get better at it. So, you know, you're gonna have tough days, but you can't let it keep you down. 
you know, going into the, the rest of the week, you got to be able to come back, bounce back, because um, your patients need you. You know, they need you the next day. Um, so they need your A game the very next day. But it's good to have people in the trenches with you. So I think that was the best for me. So, I mean, we love what we were doing and having people, you know, your colleagues, your co-interns, your co-residents that you can like laugh with. So I think that's crucial. So even when you're like trying to pick a program, you know, seeing how the residents interact, seeing who they are, um, seeing who it is you might be learning from and being with if you go to that program is crucial as well. Um, Cause I think if you don't, then it'll be, it'll make it that much worse. But having people that you can laugh with, joke about the insanity that you're going through, um, that makes it better. Like we can clown and, and laugh about the misery that we're going through together. So that kind of makes it better. Yeah, always need to bring out your A game before you approach this. Uh, very, very wise. Uh, so we have some very specific questions, which shows that people were very, very interested and invested in this. So someone asked if patient one's case, does it require some sort of therapy afterwards for a normal function of their jaw? And how can post-op therapy in general help patient recoveries? Yeah, so patient one, so with the mandible fracture, for that patient, um, he actually had dentures that were made. So dentures, he was able to use those to function, but um, we didn't, so we didn't wire him shut. So he was able to function right away. So that was kind of, that was kind of crucial. So the, the problem happens is when you wire them shut, if you wire them shut for too long, once you release them, they really can't open that wide. Uh, and it takes them couple of weeks really because they've been shut for so long their muscles have probably atrophied and scarred down because they haven't been in use so then you got to really massage them we have different um we call them therabytes we have different little appliances that we can use to kind of stretch them open in the chair and we usually give them one to take home and we give them different jaw exercising um, ideas to do at home and that with warm compresses jaw um, stretching exercises are crucial for those patients just to get them functioning again but um a lot more surgeons when they put, you know, fixation plates, especially heavy fixation plates, um, a lot of them aren't even wiring the patients down anymore. So they're able to function immediately afterwards. We just tell them stay on a soft diet. Soft diet is crucial. Like, don't let me find you like getting burgers and steaks the day after, um, you know, cause it takes the bone about six weeks to heal. And a lot of them, a lot of patients think just because we put heavy plates, like they're gonna be invincible, like for the next fight. They don't think it's gonna break again. Like, no, it'll, it'll break again. So like. So we just got to assure them, like, take it easy, soft diet for about four to six weeks, and then they should make a full recovery. Um, that's kind of stress, uh, sounds stressful, like having the buyer shot and everything. Um, so the next question that we had was, would a similar plate be used in patient three's case uh, that was used, uh, that can be used to repair a similar fracture to the maxillary sinus? So you're saying we're, you're asking if a similar plate can be used in the mandible in the maxilla? Um, yes, that's what it seems to be, yes. So, so whatever, um, you know, fracture plating company use, there's Stryker, there's Synthes, um, Biomed. So they have different plating systems. Like, so they have different plates specialized for the mandible, um, for the mid face and for the scalp and the frontal sinus. So the, the scalp and frontal sinus are usually gonna be the very like um, thin mini plates. You know, they're easily bendable um, because it's not really a load or stress bearing area. As you get to the mandible, since we're functioning, we're opening, we're chewing. So a lot of force is being applied to the lower jaw. So that's where you need heavy plates and bigger screws. Um, so it kind of goes, so for mandible, you get the biggest and the heaviest um, plates. As you get to the mid face region, you'll use um, some smaller plates still with a good amount of strength to it. And then when you get up here, it'll be pretty much cosmetic um, mesh and like really thin plates because um, thinner up here. So you don't want any big bulging plates that you can palpate. Um, but definitely for the lower jaw, since that's, that's really the only moving piece and that's where all the forces and functioning are happening. So you wanna make sure you have a really strong plate um, for those uh, mandible fractures. Good question. So we're covering all the patients today. So for patient two, will patient two need a feeding tube or some sort of other feeding during the period that their mouth is wired shut? A great question. So yeah, so when these patients are wired shut, they kind of almost, 
not almost like Phoenix. We kind of give them almost um, a huge syringe, so like a 60 cc syringe, and there's like red rubber catheters that they can use um, to feed. So anything they can blend and fit into that, they can like kind of squirt it in the back. And usually there's spaces in the back um, for them where they can get food into. But we tell them you're going to be on a liquid puree diet for four to six weeks or however long you're wired shut. Some people enjoy it, especially if, you know, they were trying to lose weight. They're like, all right, great. This is a great time for me to, to lose weight. So like some people relish in that idea, but um, it's going to be a purely liquid diet and we give them a syringe kind of feeding tube thing that they can squirt the food back there. So anything they can blend and get in there, they can eat. Most of them, we prescribe them like inshores, um, you know, some of these hearty high calorie um, protein shakes and stuff like that. So to make sure they're getting all the nutrients and stuff. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, going back to patient one. Um, so during the first diagnosis, was the affected area also the same nerve that caused the surgeon to suggest a coronectomy when removing uh, wisdom teeth? For, for patient one. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, so patient one was the dentist one. So the patient, patient one presented with no teeth. So when he came to us, he didn't have any teeth at all. He had already his teeth missing. So because of that, since the patient has no teeth, we can't use his bite to kind of align his jaw. So we have to go purely by anatomic reduction. So we have to expose the, the fracture, get a good view of the entire fracture. So we can just align the segments perfectly and plate it. Um, if they have teeth, then we can use that. If we have them in a good bite, then we know that's the most important part. Because um, when patients, I'll tell you, patients with teeth, you could do the greatest surgery, like finesse, like great closure, all that, great plating, but you, because you can plate a fracture and their bite could be off. Um, so that's key. So if you, you can have a nice plated fracture, fracture looks great, but if their bite's off, they don't care what you did in there. They don't care you were there for 10 hours. They're like, my bite is off. This sucks. Like, what did you do? So if they have teeth, you got to get their occlusion correct. You got to make sure their bite is spot on. And that tells you that the fractures are kind of in the ballpark. And then you can kind of bring them to close it up and get a nice reduction. But in patient one's case, he didn't, he presented to us with no teeth at all. So we didn't have to do anything with that. We just um, went purely anatomic reduction to reduce it. So now we're rounding out the patient questions and an audience member asked, what was the most memorable patient you treated? And what did their circumstance and treatment include? Um, yeah, that's, that's quite a bit. It's quite a bit. Um, yeah, so I mean, let's say patient four was, because we had a great connection with um, patient four and um, he was such a sweet kid. So that was definitely um, a momentous occasion. We were able to help him with that. More recently, we had a lady uh, patient come. This was when I was in Geisinger, Pennsylvania, and she had um, and this was like during the height of COVID. So, you know, everyone's, you know, everyone's kind of scared, you know, patients are coming with COVID. And so we're, you know, we're, our outpatient clinic was kind of shut down, but we were still getting a lot of consults um, from the ED. So we were still going to ED pretty regularly uh, for either fractures or infections. Uh, um, and you, did see infections increase because patients couldn't get to the dental office anymore since the dentists were closed. So now that tooth that was a cavity turns into a big infection and now it's like in their neck. And so now they're in the ED. Um, so we had a patient, she came in um, and she came in with like, from I saw from when she came, got into the ED, uh, temperature was like 104 or something like that. And, you know, everybody was concerned. Um, she had other symptoms, but it made patients, everyone got concerned for COVID. Like, hey, well, maybe she might have COVID because she was having a lot of pain. She didn't really have any swelling at the time. So it was really nonspecific. So people weren't sure like why her symptoms were so severe. Um, and then it finally turned out, we took another scan. I saw her eventually when they consulted us and she did have some dental infection. It looked pretty mild. And on the scan, her scan didn't show that much infection um, that correlated with the amount of pain that she was having. So we took her to the OR, we took out, you know, the offending teeth and we did an intraoral drainage and we got some pus, which we didn't expect because we didn't see any pus on the scan, which you can see. And we got a lot of pus out, we're like, oh, wow. And we cleaned it up really well. Um, 
And then we kept, you know, we sent her back to her room. She was doing well overnight. In the morning, she was having a little bit of pain and she was in like the, um, we call it the PCU. So she was in a, like a elevated um, standard of care in the, uh, in the hospital. And then they downgraded her because it seemed she was doing fine. And then one of my interns were rounding on her in the afternoon um, and they had downside, they had downgraded her to just a regular med floor. And then when he went in to see her, he came and he called me like, it doesn't look right. I didn't see her this morning, but she can't talk right now. Her tongue is like coming out of her mouth. I'm like, what? And so I quickly rush over there and like, I call my attending. I'm like, I'm going there now to see what's going on. And we go in, I go in and like, she's like seconds away from like the Ludwigs. And I'm like, who was sitting on this? And then, you know, and you got to think about it, like, because of COVID, hospitals kind of went to, you know, minimal contact. So, you know, maybe nurses and stuff weren't going in as often to see what was going on. And then luckily we got there because she was second. The infection was spreading to both sides of the neck and her airway was pretty much from closing. We got in, like her tongue was protruding out. So her airway was about to be closed. I'm like, we got to get her to the ICU now. She needs to be intubated. Um, so the, she, long story short, she went to the ICU. She got intubated. We got a new scan. Now you're seeing new full collections um, that were just progressing. So then people were still concerned about COVID. So she was getting tested. She finally came back negative, but they weren't, they weren't that convinced. So they wanted to do a tracheal aspirate. So she, she, we took her to the OR like three times. Um, and we were so concerned because she just wasn't getting better. Like then we're going to the neck. So now she has three incisions in the neck. We're putting drains in. Um, so it just became a heavy ordeal multiple times to the OR to drain it. And luckily she finally got better. You know, we had ID on board. So she's on, you know, cocktail of antibiotics um, to get good coverage. And finally we got the infection down. Um, she got better. She finally got discharged. She was so happy. She, she was a photographer and like, she was, she was affiliated with some local newspaper. So like she did, she had them come out and like did like a little thank you segment on our attendings and a program for like, um, or say, cause she was really scared, but she's like, you guys took care of me, made me laugh. Like, she felt really good. So that was, that was, I'm just, I was really happy to see her, you know, the amount of surgeries that she went to to finally get her back to her old self again was um, pretty incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. It sounds very interesting, but um, stressful as well. I'm yeah. kind of glad that she got through. Yeah. Um, so someone had a question about research. Um, they say that they're asking that, are you able to do research outside of hospital work? Or have you been involved in any research during your journey? If so, what did your research involve? Yeah, so I mean, you definitely can do research. Um, and that is, well, in residency, like it's usually requirements of most programs. So our attending is always writing book chapters. So um, we had different case studies and case reports that we were doing. Um, so I, I, we, I did different ones. One, uh, we did it it was a book chapter for how to treat um, a gummy smile. So we went through different um, different treatment approaches and algorithms that you can treat for patients with, um, you know, gingival hyperplasia or if they have vertical um, maxillary excess, pretty much they could have a elongated jaw or a really gummy smile and how you can treat that. Um, and I did papers on um, how to avoid any traumatic nasal intubations because we had a case where the patient was intubated and they did um, inadvertent inferior turbinate, turbinectomy. So that one of the turbinates was fractured off and it was lodged within the tube. And nobody noticed it until the end of the case. The anesthesia mentioned like the pressures were kind of off, but you know, the patient was still satting okay. And then my attending, like once the tube was, once the patient was extubated, he saw the tube lodged into the, he saw the turbinate, turbinate, turbinate lodged into the tube. So he's like, well, that's what it was. And it can be, you know, there was different papers of the tube actually going into the, the main bronch, the main bronchus. So that can be definitely problematic. So luckily it stayed lodged in the tube and didn't descend into the trachea. So um, did a paper on that, but yeah, there's a lot of research opportunities that you can do. Um, and mo most attendees are doing something. We'll be happy to have you on it. So there's plenty of opportunities for research and case reports and case studies and stuff like that. So uh, I wanted to avoid this topic, COVID-19 but it must be addressed. So with your residency in New York, which is a hot spot for COVID, how has your job and workplace been affected? 
Um, so for me, it was funny thing. So when I was in residency, so I was in Pennsylvania at the time, right when COVID hit, so like March, you know, February, March, I was in Pennsylvania and it was like rural, like central Pennsylvania and Danville. So really was not much going on there. Um, and my vacation and my daughter's birthday was coming up on like the 25th. And I had already, I had vacation that whole year. My vacation was the week of the 25th because that was my daughter's birthday. So that's how I planned it from the beginning. And then obviously COVID happened. And then there was, you know, New York was just sl slowly getting worse and worse. And they're like, Rob, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go home. I was like, my wife and child in New York. And like, at that time, New York was like, it was getting scary. I was like, and my wife was scared. I was like, I can't, you know, like, what do you want me to do? Like, I can't not go, like, she, you know, she's nervous. You know, she's, she was already off from work. So she was staying in the house. I'm like, you know, I, I gotta go, you know, I still have my family, I gotta go, you know. So I didn't have a choice. So I went and I told him, I'm not going anywhere. We're just gonna be at home. And then, so they gave me a stipulation, okay, go. And then when you come back, you'll just quarantine for like a week. And then that'll be that. I'm like, all right, I'll do that. And then like the day later, after I get back to New York, they're like, uh, yeah. So they said you can't come back. And I was like, what? And I'm like, okay. So I say, I pretty much stayed there for like several weeks. I was like, cause I had nowhere to go. I didn't go to the New York programs cause they're kind of shut down and um, there was no need for me to come cause they already had achieved there. So I just pretty much stayed at home for like a couple of weeks until finally they said, um, I can come back and, and do that but when I, i'll tell you at that moment when i got to new york it just really felt like uh it, it felt scary like when i got back from pennsylvania new york i felt like you couldn't even breathe the air like you're just worried about breathing the air outside it was just that type of aura i was like i gotta get back to pennsylvania um just because the sheer new york got hit hard just because the sheer number of people and just close quarters everyone's in the subway like it's it was unavoidable to get that massive of a spread but it, it was tough a lot of our new york hospitals when i did go back there it was tough. There was a lot of deaths every day, as you guys know at the time. There was like freezer trucks out of all of our hospitals because they just had no room for, uh, you know, people that didn't make it anymore. So it, it was pretty morbid in New York. Um, I'm glad they're kind of plateauing now, but at that time it was it was tough. It was really tough at that time, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that journey. So for the last question for the session today, um, what advice do you have for aspiring surgeons? Uh, great question. So my advice to you is to, you know, kind of just go for it. Um, that's that's the main um, that's the main premise of it all. Don't don't let anyone you know knock you. Don't let anyone stop you or deter you or discourage you. You know, if surgery is something you want to do. Um, whatever subspecialty of surgery, you know, it's going to be a long road. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be ups and downs, long nights. Um, you know, you may think, or you know, this may, bro you, know, you have to postpone getting a family, but I don't think you do. You just have to, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, pick your timing and stuff like that, but it can definitely be done. Um, you know, programs are reasonable and they'll be able to, you know, they're definitely understanding, you know, if you have a family and stuff like that. So it can be done. You don't have to wait till you're done with residency if, unless you wanted to, which is fine as well. But, um, just work hard, you know, have a good attitude. Um, don't burn bridges because you, you never know when you need people, your co-residents, you're gonna need, you, you're gonna have to rely on them. You're gonna need them to have your back and stuff like that. Um, and just be a go-getter, you know, be aggressive in what you want, but, you know, still be professional at the same time. Um, and have, try to, try to enjoy the moment. Uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely tough. Like I said, it's up and down, but if you, if you enjoy it, you'll definitely find, you know, the beauty and the fun of, you know, doing different procedures, you know, that one case that goes well for you, you know, take, you know, highlight that moment, remember that moment, remember how you felt when you did your first case, your first incision on things like that. So um, in terms of surgery, like definitely have a passion for it, you know, um, don't go into it thinking you're gonna, you know, make a whole lot of money when you get out, you know, there's a lot of easier ways to make money for sure. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So you got to have a passion for it. And if you love what you do, um, you'll get it. Um, you'll go after it. And like I said, if don't give up, if you didn't match the first time, if you really want to do it, it will happen. If you, if you really want to make something happen, it's going to happen. Even if it takes one, two or three tries, um, if it was meant to be, and you really want it, you'll find a way to get there. So don't let anything deter you. Don't let anything put you down. Like I said, when you have those bad moments or 
you're getting yelled at or something goes wrong, um, just take it in and say, okay, it happened. Get over it. All right, let's figure out what we what we got to do next. What we got, what do we have to do to fix it? And if it's fixed, okay, let's look at tomorrow. Tomorrow's a brand new day. We got to come back and do the same thing again. That's another chance for me to be great. So just always look to the next day um, as trying to be better than you were before. And if you just keep doing that, you'll you'll never stop achieving because you're just always trying to climb the ladder, beat your personal best. I'm not trying to be better than this guy, be better than that guy. I'm just trying to be, you know, the best that I can be every day. And you do that, you have that mentality, you'll, 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 you'll do fine, you'll do great, you'll achieve great things. So that's my advice for you guys. Thank you so much for sharing that. It was really inspiring to be here today. Even as a pre-PA student, I got really engaged with the cases that you presented. And um, I think everybody really enjoyed being here. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just gonna um, give up a wrap up presentation and then we can um, enjoy our day. All right, thank so you guys. Um, let's take a moment to reflect. Let's take uh, some, let's answer some questions. What brought you to the session today? What are your key takeaways? And what more do you wanna learn? It's definitely a very interesting specialty that is like so vast that you wanna like explore it. So uh, write that down. It's not necessary for you to submit it, but if you want to get it published or want some recognition, you can definitely submit it at uh, Prehealth Shadowing and we can help you um, have it on our website. You, it can be articles, it can be reflections, reviews, or success stories as well. Um, again, try to take, like Dr. Pierre said, try to take uh, the opportunities that are presented in front of you. So if you don't have the time to commit being a team member, we also have uh, opportunities for student volunteers. And if you do have the time to help us out, we are also accepting a, in, um, applications for team members. Again, we are uh, a nonprofit, registered nonprofit. Please help us uh, reach out to as many people as we can. So please donate as much as you can. And if you can't, we understand you're all pre-health students. So just um, try to uh, pass on the ma message and try to get us some funds so that we can really go ahead and um, reach out to as many people as we can. And to get your certificate for Dr. Pierre's uh, shadowing session, you go to you can go to our website and take the course. It's a 10 question quiz that you have two uh, attempts for and you have to get seven out of 10 questions right. And then you get your certificate that can be used for any purposes like CVs, applications and stuff. And if you, uh, if you missed our session today due to some technical difficulties or any other sessions, you can go to our uh, YouTube channel and get any of the sessions there for free as well. And please be sure to catch, uh, catch our upcoming sessions. We really look forward to seeing all of you ahead as well. And if you have any questions, we are here. We, the team members are gonna stick around for a while. So let us know if you have any questions. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Pierre, for joining us today. It was really great to be a part of the session.